All right, well, I guess we're about two minutes after the window. I figured some of the talks ran over, so I figured I'd wait a minute or two after. Um, but yeah, uh, talking about attack surface reduction, in case you couldn't read. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to just do some basics and define the attack surface. Uh, just talk about some parts of Zen's attack surface that just from a high level identified. Um, 30 minute window doesn't really give you time to really dive down into specifics, so I'm trying to keep it more high level. Uh, just then try to give some, attack surface is really kind of a hard thing to gauge, so there's some metrics, and I was talking with Steve that we use very similar metrics from his talk on QMU KVM. Um, to find some attack surface reduction, uh, what we've accomplished to date with Zen releases, and then last ways, uh, how, how can we improve? Um, so yeah, so attack surface defined in the context of Zen is really any privileged code with an interface, intentional or not, that's accessible by domains or out of band. Uh, and I mean out of band like DMA and, and, and things like that. Um, but uh, coming from the defense world, uh, a lot of times the community is obsessed about attack surface or something like that, and they don't necessarily try to understand the system before they reduce, before they try to reduce the attack surface. So the focus a lot of time becomes, well, we've just reduced the number of lines of code, which doesn't really mean anything on a whole, but then you're going to see me talk about lines of code. So it, it is and it isn't. Um, so you got to kind of break your system down and understand it, and um, there's, um, the web people have done the, uh, have, have really understood attack surface a lot better than, for example, people in the embedded space, and I guess web people wasn't, uh, people that do web apps and whatnot are, are kind of understanding that a little better, and they have, uh, there's an organization called OWASP, um, and they do kind of an attack surface cheat, cheat sheet, um, and, and kind of the, goals that people try to break it down is into like a, can I break it down into functionally or by design or role based to kind of take the system apart? Because you can't look at something like Zen and say, this is the attack surface, which is what I'm going to do since time constraints. Um, but yes, so there, like I said, there's, there's hard to put some metrics on what is attack surface, but people incorrectly use lines of code, but you can also use lines of code correctly because you kind of look at a P, like I said, you break it down into a functional component and, for example, the instruction emulator. And you can say the instruction emulator is one piece and you can say it's got this many lines of codes, lines of code, it's had this many CVEs over a window, um, and then what is its relative complexity to other components in the, in the system? And that's kind of how you can give yourself a metric. Um, if you've ever done Scrum, it's kind of like Scrum points. You know, it's, they're relative to each other. So, yeah. So, then going into the metrics of Zen. So, um, yeah, like I said, I, I'm, I'm staying very high level, which we'd really want to get more specific if we were really breaking it down. But I kind of chose uh, two parts of Zen, the hypervisor and the tool stack. So, as you can see, uh, I won't read out the numbers, but the hypervisor's growing and the tool stack's growing but not at a large enough pace. So it's it's a large piece it's a large code base uh, and it's ever growing. Um, then looking at um, Zen, the number of CVEs increased drastically in 2015. Um, but we're on a decline pattern. And I realize now that I said CVEs and I believe I actually counted XSAs which don't line up one for one, but we'll just, uh, we'll just swag it. And then um, I primarily am focused on x86. Uh, other people in my office are focused on ARM, but since I'm focused on x86, I'm just going to make the general assumption that anything relying on the Intel Instruction Architecture Manual uh, is a complex piece of software because, uh, you know, we still don't have a full spec of x86. Um, so, yeah, so... What are some of the attack surfaces of Zen? From a high level, uh, all your hypercalls um, are, 
are an attack surface. That's, that's right there. That's your interface for a guest to ask the hypervisor to do something or ask somebody else to do something. Um, but um, the attack surface there that could, could be worked on is a lot of the hyper calls are unused if you're running in PV, a lot of the HVM ones. A lot of the PV calls are unused when you're running in HVM. So you know, that's, that's something that we could, we could work on uh, reducing. Um, I've already mentioned the instruction emulator is large and um, full of uh, scary things. Um, it does emulate in place, which um, something we've you know we've discussed as um, being improved upon. Um, SMM obviously uh, it can stop you. It can do whatever it wants and then start you back up. Um, so SMM. Uh, is and, and really any of the management engines uh, out there, any of the management engine pieces can do evil things to you. Um, if you're running Zen as a nested hypervisor, I know a bunch of people have been, uh, you really have that implicit trust of the hypervisor above you um, and call outs there. There's, there's uh, things that could happen. Um, DMA, um, what about evil misconfigured devices? Is that good? I don't know. Um, and then I, I told Conrad I'd pick on him, and I said live patch. Uh, well, you know, you're just you're asking the hypervisor, hey, run this code and ring minus one, please. And it says no problem. Uh, and so the migration and introspection gives a way to peek into other guests, and you know, you break out, you can do other things. Um, I figured I'd roughly touch on some DOM0 items. So um, you've got, we've got QMU, which I mean, a bulk of our CVEs over the years or over the last year has been QMU related. Um, right now Zen is stuck on the legacy device model and um, all of its devices and all of its legacy bits uh, I'm sure people remember the floppy disk controller being used as a exploit vector, which uh, how many people have floppies in their laptops now? So, um, and then I think Lars touched on it earlier as well, um, or maybe George was improving the permissions, deprivileging QMU. You know, that's that's obviously something that that reduces the surface ability. Uh, and then Jim touched on something, uh, having libxl open uh, except file descriptors. So right now, Excel kind of opens, it, it, it lets QMU open files, QMU's not locked down, Excel is libxl is opening files. Um, a lot of the management stacks like libvert and whatnot will instead pass in file descriptors to the underlying tools and those tools have been locked down further. So um, Zen does not do that right now. Um, and obviously QMU has the ability through any of the many vectors and legacy devices to affect memory inside the guest, um, which has been used uh, to poke around as. Um. So uh, with Zen, we all, we've also got a number of legacy APIs that are unused or untested that can learn, lead to uh, problems. Uh, the one that I've been poking on the mailing list, uh, for example, is if you use proc zen, zen bus on a modern kernel in a DOM U, you're going to deadlock. Um, and, and it's just unused. Um, missing or crash daemons. So if you have zen store go away, let's say, you know, what, what happens? Uh, not a good thing. Um, and obviously, I guess I included migration on two slides. Um, so yeah, so what is attack surface reduction? Um, I guess I kind of aim the slides a little more high level because everybody was a little more understanding. Um, I usually target this towards a uh, different crowd. Um, so the mitigation of security risks through the reduction of code exposed to users. And um, this is one where I was just telling 
Steve when he gave his QMU KVM talk that I was glad that we both had, you know, some of the similar wording in the end, you know, reduce the feature set, which is reduce the lines of code, but um, intelligently reduce the lines of code. Like I said, a lot of times people just take lines of code as a raw metric and it's really not. Um, but at the end of the day, if you don't need the feature, don't build it in because if it's possible, uh, avoid that. Uh, and then reduce permissions. So, uh, so then where are we today with Zen 4.7? So we've got kconfig. Um, right now you're able to, do, and, and again, I'm, I'm giving rules and then I'm immediately next slide breaking them because here I'm saying, well, 14,000 lines of code, but I'm not really giving some kind of metric. But um, if you remember from the earlier slides, Zen, the hypervisor is about 275 uh, thousand lines of code. Well, right now, with the 4.7 release, you're able to turn off 14,000 lines of code. At least one of the CVEs that I found would have been closed had you turned all those switches off. Shadow paging stuff. Okay, so that would be the last one that would be shadow paging now. Just, I, I, just, you know, a quick read uh, leads to that because that the source code was literally, would have been if deft out. Um, but um, another big one that we don't take advantage of, we're still using all the discretionary access controls and um, we've got XSM, Flask. We really um, should use it uh, as a community if, for, for security aspects. Um, because you're able to reduce, reduce your permissions with better policies so that you're not exposing everything under the sun. Um, as far as DMA attacks, um, find a lot of times that uh, machines that people are using Zen on are booting them up and not using the IOMMU. And just through poorly configured BIOS, I mean, uh, very often I see machines where it's like they either didn't turn it on or the BIOS is like moody where you got to toggle it on and off to get the IOMMU. So if we had a more direct mode towards, uh, or you can use IOMMU force uh, on the command line and make sure you've got that. Um, Andrew marked all the pages read only, which was a, you know, a benefit. Okay, no execute. Yes, that's, that's true. So, um, uh, then we've got stub doms, uh, and we've got other stub doms. I've mentioned Zen store, but, uh, that means using Zen, uh, C Zen store right now, which, uh, I know a lot of people will shake their heads at. Um, and then, um, there's a lot of disaggregation that can be done and OpenXT is doing that. Um, and the downstream derivatives of OpenXT are doing that. So that's, uh, stuff that can be done. I guess I had the same slide twice. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I guess the last bullet was, unfortunately most of all the security stuff is disabled by default. Um, sorry, I got a little lost here. So, uh, yeah, I must have made some edit or hit a key or something. So, apologies. I had a better transition and not a double slide. Hopefully online it's better that way. I'll fix it. Um, so, some things that we can do going forward is what, is what this is. Um, so, we've talked about um, once PBH lands at doing some kind of breakup that only the hyper calls necessary for PVH uh, are, are built into a Zen. And then for supporting PV, you can have a, uh, a Zen that's only supporting the PV hyper calls and you're running your PV and legacy stuff that way. Um, so that would reduce the hyper calls that are vi visible. Um, so that's something we can do, have kconfig targets for. Um, the instruction emulator I kind of mentioned earlier, 
Uh, it's big, it emulates in place, um, it touches things. Uh, there's been talks, I know, on the QMU, KVM side and whatnot to kind of uh, deprivilege that, move that you know, out of uh, where it's at, uh, or potentially chop it up so that it happens in multiple phases and deprivilege part of that phase um, so that it uh, is not all running in a privileged uh, phase. So um, another thing we can do is remove some of the automatic software f fallbacks. So we've k-configured out, for example, shadow paging, um, which is going to require that you have EPT or N MPT. Um, but there's, other, there's further bits that can be done um, for, for that. So for example, the IOMMU, you could do something where you just have to have the IOMMU. Um, so when people are adding new features, I'm glad to see that people are adding them k-configged um, so that we can kind of graduate them in. Uh, so for example, live patch, to pick on Conrad again, uh, you know, in 4.7 was a tech preview. And then with hopefully with 4.8, it's going to be, you know, something that'll default on. Uh, but, uh, you know, some of the questions that, that I think people have had and the concerns about kconfig uh, are how are we going to test it, how are we going to graduate things. So I, I, I'm planning on putting a session for, uh, to talk about that, what, uh, what that means for kconfig expert and preview and all those flags there. Um, so one area that I've been also interested in looking at is adding a, so SMM mode is effectively ring negative two, runs below the hypervisor, can stop you, traps out, uh, kind of what the hypervisor does to the Linux operating system. Um, but uh, Intel now has extensions that are, or has a blob that could be used that's like a, that they call an STM, which is an SMM transfer mode. Um, requires your BIOS to cooperate, um, but if you're, if you're in an environment where you are working with a BIOS vendor on something, uh, it could be something interesting to add for having a more secure device uh, so that you can really prevent some of that from happening. And uh, I plan on doing some more work on that and posting some stuff to the mailing list. Um, yeah, go ahead. Expand a bit. Yeah, yeah. When you mean... Sorry. I mean, usually SMM, SMMs are used for uh, workarounds in the hardware. Correct. So for STM, what is it actually... Is it still running the workarounds, or does it just take over? Yeah, uh, so it, it, you, you, your STM is the one that's actually going to receive the SMI, and so you're gonna, it's going to trap to that. And then it's up to the STM to actually give it to the SMM. So there has to be like a, co like, there's a cooperation because SMM mode starts up first and you kind of got to tell it, hey, I'm going to load this STM. Let's be cool. I promise to send you everything um, and let you do what you need to do. But then you don't actually have to send it everything because there's some stuff that you're just like, yeah, at this point, um, I don't know, like uh, USB keyboard stuff. Yeah, you don't need to do, you know, you don't need to emulate a, an old AT keyboard. So you can, okay. you can filter out what it can do. Um, and there's also the theory that I've been reading that um, there's some work that can be done to shield off the management engine if you don't trust the management engine through that mechanism. Um, what is the concern? What's the security concern with SMM? You know, like I, I looked at all your attack vectors. Yeah. The SMM one wasn't clear. Uh, okay, so um, there have been a number of exploits that have loaded code into the, well, there's one really, that have loaded code into the SMM. Um, if somebody loads code into the SMM, if there's another attack vector through that mechanism, they can stop the hypervisor and they can trap out. The only way to load code into the SMM is if you have root access and you can upgrade the BIOS of Flash Firmware or something. No, no. Uh, is, it, is it a vulnerability in the handle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
there are, there are a number of cases where the vulnerability in the SMM code has allowed code injection from outside. So this is this is to deal with the with the uh, code injection to a buggy SMM handler. <coughs> if you fully trust everything that's running not to be So is STM sort of a, I'm sorry, it's a naive question. Yeah. Is this an industry initiative, STM, is there? Like uh, it's it's uh, something by Intel, and I can um, I can pull up the paper the paper on that. Uh, you just say it's an industry initiative. Yeah, it's, it's something by Intel. So Intel has a reference design, um, and my understanding is, uh, you know, somebody like Microsoft has has worked with them and integrated something like that into uh, Azure. Um, yes. Yeah, it, it requires new hardware support. It also requires some cooperation from your BIOS vendor. Um, and what led me down this path is a, I'll divert for a second, um, is back in the day, dealt with hardware that had a um, kind of a baseband management um, and it could inject some code to run in the SMM mode and out of band. And I was like, that, I don't want that on my hardware. So I mean, if you, like Andrew said, if you trust everything in there, then great. But if you don't, then that's not great. And you know, do you, you know, that, that's kind of the idea. Um, and then I've, Conrad's actually mentioned this, and I'm glad, uh, but he mentioned uh, signature checks for live patch. Um, right now, you load whatever you give it, and it immediately puts that in. Um, so I kind of mentioned this already, um, but refactor the instruction emulator uh, into kind of two phases um, so we can deprivilege part of it. Um, and then some idea I've had is kind of having like a set comp BPF on the hyper calls so that you can load like a set comp policy through Excel uh, and restrict out hyper calls that your domain shouldn't be allowed to use. Kind of a intermediate to people that don't want to use XSM Flask. Um, just again, most, most of these are just ideas um, and, and not entirely fleshed out. Um, but one thing I'd love to see is then to switch to XSM Flask by default. Um, I know there's still a couple of pain points, but we're working towards that. Um, and then dynamically make domains not migratable uh, or not introspectable. You know, the introspection API is great, but at the same time, uh, the introspection API is great for doing malicious things. Um, and then obviously some areas to research are um, the encrypted memory modes. And I specifically, if, if you guys have read about SGX or AMD secure memory, I have specifically put SGX version three, which SGX version two has already been announced and it is lacking. Um, and then AMD secure memory, uh, I think we have a talk about it. Um, tomorrow, but um, we'll see how, how much and where the hardware pans out. Um, so uh, Dom Zero, we add a lot of support into LibXL. We add a lot of different features there. Uh, there is no real granular, there's no kconfig ability to limit um, scope. You might have requirements that you don't need some feature X out of LibXL or out of the tool stack, and it'd be nice sometimes to be able to disable those features so that they're just not there to run. Um, QMU, uh, I had mentioned earlier the 
device model we use is a legacy device model that includes a whole bunch of toys uh, and legacy I.O. ports uh, that have been used for bad means. Um, if you've ever looked at the QMU code, uh, the Q35 uh, device is a lot more modular. It lets you turn off a lot more. It's a little more modern. So that'd be something that'd be interesting for us to look towards um, supporting that. Um, and then something, something like for the deep privileged uh, that George was talking about, we could potentially just uh, allow the chance to do like wrappers to call unshare to stick QMU in its own namespace. E let it run as root, but just as a something, some small step towards that deprivileging. Run it, run it, run it in a namespace. Don't let it see the normal file system anymore. Don't let it see, you know, the network anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't need that. Um, and then I guess I already mentioned marking a VM as unmigratable. Um, and then something I kind of mentioned earlier during Jim's talk: uh, ship less. We ship a QMU. And we're on the hook for all the security vulnerabilities in QMU, uh, as as far as the not every single one, but all the ones that, that affect us. Um, it, it'd be easier on the distros and on on whatnot if they had one QMU that was the official QMU that Zen supported. And yeah, sorry. Yes, so you can you can do it, but Zen still ships it, and so therefore Zen has to. I'm saying the Zen maintainers are responsible for looking after and issuing XSAs, which yes, there's maintainership overlap, but it wouldn't be a Lars wouldn't have to write a press release for Zen 4.7 if the Zen 4.7 tarball didn't include that version of QMU. That's kind of. Um, and then last one, uh, Zen ships a whole lot of scripts, um, scripts that need a Perl, Python, Bash, and, and run them as root a lot of times and should be thinking about ways that we can deprivilege that as well to, uh, from QMU. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm running uh, way over, so I apologize. I'll be quick. Um, so uh, I think the OpenXT guys and some other guys mentioned it is one of the security and compartmentalization of Zen is one of the leading advantages of Zen over KVM. Um, it really shines, and but we have to focus on not making security in Zen hard, uh, make it default because right now we have most of the security. A lot of the security bits are off by default. Um, really advertise XSM Flask, turn on by default because it can limit a lot of damage. Um, and then um, currently, if you guys are familiar with MILS, which is multiple independent layers of security, you can't achieve that today with Zen. Um, there's a number of factors in that. Um, Currently, one of those factors is the lack in Zen Store of a Mac. Um, and so that's one thing that, that I've actually been working on these past few um, weeks is to add a Mac to the Zen Store. Um, and that's, I looked at the C Zen Store code, um, which I regret doing. Um, I looked at the OCaml stuff. And I'm fortunate I'm not on a camel guy. Um, I've looked at Galois made a uh, Mac implementation, but it's kind of bit rotted a little bit. And I'm not a Haskell guy. I do know Rust, which is similarly functional and aims to close a bunch of the normal buffer overflow vulnerabilities. So I've gone down the road of writing my own Zen store, which uh, with a coworker of mine, which has not proved to be difficult. It's just the protocol uh, and the spec and the two implementations often disagree with each other. So that's that's been uh, an interesting thing.
thing. Uh, but we basically got a, um, we use Rust, we got really strict with types, uh, we get the memory safety for free with Rust. Um, we got a Flask-based security server and an access vector cache in there. Um, and using the SE Linux, you know, the, the policy tools to build a policy in there. Um, right now, it runs inside of DOM0 only, but uh, future goals include uh, making a Zen backend to run directly on like PVH mode and uh, we are releasing that any day now. It's GPL2. Just need everybody to, you know, I need to, like, 45 signatures. So that's been the problem. So anyway. So one of your mitigating uh, suggestions, uh, which is uh, very sensible, also counterintuitive, is the cake and fake of configuring less. Yeah. When you configure less, I mean, first of all, with all these config knobs, there's a lot of dependencies between those configs. When you configure less, is there a chance that you're actually opening up an attack vector by opening up a dependency which was never exercised before? Yeah, and so that's, 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 uh, that'll, I think I posted one of the post-it notes for, for tomorrow as a, um, going forward, there's the current set of knobs that how they've been before everything got k-configed, and that's the security supported. But kind of we need to test more, potentially test more, and how does how are those features how the, how is that tested? I don't I don't know the answer, um, but it it'll require some some improved testing and. Uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer. Sorry. Any any other questions? All right. Well, that's it. <laughs>